God is so good. Here we are about to finish up 2 Peter. So with that, take your Bibles and look at the final instructions in waiting. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. We started this journey through 2 Peter back in the first week of January. 17 messages later, we have finally come to the end of Peter's second letter to those elect exiles in Asia Minor. In this letter, Peter has urged Christians to pursue godliness and holiness now. To pursue it now, in your life now, today, at this moment. For this world will melt away under the judgment of God. But he also goes on to state that not only will this world be destroyed, but there's going to be a new world that takes its place. And we looked at that last week at the new heaven and new earth and how that is wonderful, great motivation for us as Christians as God comes to rescue the godly. This kingdom will be filled with God's righteousness and justice. All the nations and its rulers will bow before the King of kings and Lord of lords. There will be no disparity. There will be no lack, no injustice, no racism, no sin. Truly what, the Isaiah, the, what Isaiah the prophet wrote will finally be realized when he wrote, From of old no one has heard, or perceived by the ear, nor eye has seen, a God besides you, speaking of the Almighty, who acts for those who wait for him. And that's what we're talking about. This is what Peter is talking about today for those of us who are waiting for God to come to rescue the godly in a midst of in a world that is hostile to our faith, that is hostile to Christ. Second Peter is Peter's farewell letter. It was written around 67 to 68 AD, several years before his first letter that we looked at last year. It is believed that Peter is writing from prison during the reign of Nero, Caesar of Rome, and he knows that his death is near. These are his last words to those people who he calls beloved. The theme of 1 Peter was dealing with suffering and opposition from outside the community, those who were hostile to their faith. While the theme of 2 Peter has been about dealing with suffering and opposition that comes from within the church. Those who profess Christ. Those who would say they are Christians. In his first letter, Peter encourages and comforts the believers to endure patiently the suffering that they will uh, um, experience. While his second letter is full of urgent and stern warnings as well as encouragements and comfort but it's more on the urgence and the stern warnings the danger that peter is addressing in his second letter is the apostasy the falling away of those that proclaim to be christians but yet in their lives and in their hearts they really are not and the warnings that false teachers will creep in and cause havoc among churches he charges the false teachers as those who are ignorant and unstable, those who twist scriptures to their own destructions. He has described their behavior as a matter of review for us, their behavior and character as those who repudiate or renounce the lordship of Christ in their life. They are haughty in their attitude, prideful. They disregard moral restraints. They desire to live life according to their own uh, desires. They're adulterous, greedy, bombastic, meaning that they were boastful, boastful in their language, very super, almost supernaturally confident. And they were libertine, people who were unrestrained by convention or morality. Anything goes was their mantra. In addition to his warnings about false teachers, Peter, before his death, is taking time during this letter we've seen to stress the importance of the inspiration of Scripture. That the word of God is a revelation of God. And that you and I are to hold it dear. We live in a day and age. Again, every generation it seems has to fight this battle. That the Bible is not relevant. Or the Bible is not the word of God. Or the Bible is just a collection of man's writings. But yet we need to hold on to it. Knowing that it's the word of God for us. He stresses the doctrine of the personal return of Christ. Christ is returning. As the angel says, as you see him ascend, so will he come again. Peter finally writes, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just 
as our beloved Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them from of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do in the other scriptures. In verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we continue to finish up this passage of Scripture, just open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have. Father, be with me as I speak. Let me speak words that are edifying. Let us know the difference between my mere opinion and those of your word. Lord, let us be sanctified in truth that we find. Lord, open our minds and hearts to receive it, but also then to respond as you may call us to this morning. In all things, we pray that you be glorified. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Peter once again addresses them as beloved as he closes his letter with some final instructions. As one of the apostles of Jesus, an elder and shepherd of the flock of God, his heart yearns for believers to mature in Christ. You might recall that sanctification, if we're here working with our monitor, it seems like we may have a few issues here, but you may recall Wayne Grumman as he defines sanctification is that it's a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more like Christ or freer from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. Sanctification is a progressive work. In other words, it's something that takes our life. It works from time to time or, or it moves gradually through our life. And it's a work of God and man that makes us more and more freer from sin and more like Christ in our actual lives. This is God's plan according to Scripture. This is our goal in life, to become freer from sin. At least, I hope that's your goal and desire. If you're like me, you're, you're ready for, the, for Christ to come just so I can be free from the presence of sin. No longer feeling the desire to go against God's word. This is our goal in life, to become freer from sin. And more like Christ in our attitudes and in our actions. This journey, though, you must understand, this journey to sanctification will last our whole life. We'll never reach perfection until the day that Christ comes. Now, I have to admit, it's a long, difficult, and sometimes it is a lonely road. But that's why, that's one reason that God created or ordained the church and commanded us to do life together. So that you and I must understand that in this sanctification, this journey, you and I are to serve one another, to accept one another, to forgive one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be devoted to one another, to honor one another, to encourage, submit, and to teach one another. He's called us to do that together. We are not on this journey alone. As we approach this letter... Peter is concerned for his beloved children in the Lord to conduct, to conduct themselves so that they may be effective and fruitful during the extended delay. Now let me take a moment to, to talk about this extended delay. When we talk about delay, you say, what are you talking about? What delay is it? Well, the delay when Jesus will come again. If we were to go back to Acts chapter 1, again, we'd see where the disciples were watching, talking with Jesus, and Jesus began to ascend to heaven. And the angel said, as you see him go, so shall he return. Jesus himself said, I will come again and I will come soon. The disciples, as Jesus was getting to send, ready to ascend after the crucifixion, they asked him, are you ready now to set up your kingdom? And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Instead, make disciples. Go ye therefore into all the world. Baptize them. And I will be with you until the end of the age. So in our mind, we think, wait, there must be a delay. But in Christ, there is no delay. It's not like God has forgotten. It's not like God is late or we've decided that he has something else to do. The delay is on our side. For the apostles were thinking that Jesus was going to come soon. That as you read in the, the book of Acts, the disciples, the, the church as it grew, expected Jesus to come at any moment. But here we are 2,000 years later. I don't know about you, but some of us might be tapping our, uh, you know, our foot and looking at our calendars and say, where is the promise of his coming? That's what they attacked the disciples in the church with. 
So the delay here, the extended delay, is not because God has forgotten or has gotten busy or changed his mind. But the delay is on our side as we try to discern God's timing and God's work. So he says, during this extended delay between his ascension and his return, you and I are to be effective and fruitful. But Peter is writing, there's some things here that will keep you from being, that these false teachers are keeping you, the church, from doing what Christ has called you to do. You see, false teachers have crept into the church. Look, he says, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation. So here's his final instructions. You can almost imagine a father speaking to his children as he's on his deathbed. And he wants to give them final instructions. I want you to be successful in life. I want you to be effective. I want you to carry on my name. But here are two things that you need to do. Please listen to them. These are of most importance. And what are they? He says, while waiting. For the delay, you need to do this. Number one, be diligent to be found at peace without spot or blemish. Be diligent to be found at peace without spot or blemish. Now, diligent refers to being eager, making every effort to supplement to our faith. We can go back to verse 5 of of chapter 1 when he says, Make every effort to supplement to your faith these qualities. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Dr. Thomas Schreiner notes that believers should be diligently pursuing virtues. Why? For they are the one necessary, they are necessary for the final award. Without these qualities, he says, that we will not be effective. We will not prove to be children of God. He also tells us that not only to be diligent to make effort to supplement your faith, to grow in Christ, but also that you and I are to be without spot or blemish. Now, being without spot or blemish, let me encourage you here. Because as soon as you see that, we all see the failure in our own lives, right? We know the moment we look in the mirror and truly look into our own eyes, the sinful nature that is still within us, or that still desires for us to follow our own path. But being without spot or blemish is not moral perfection. You and I will never receive that until the day that he glorifies us. And that's his promise in Romans 8, 28. For those he called, he justified. For those he justified, he will glorify. That speaks of the time that we're in the new heavens, when Christ returns. But it's speaking about being doctorly and morally pure. It means pursuing those things. Peter is echoing the words of the Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus when he said that God has chosen us in himself before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Not morally pure, but we're pursuing it. Our desire is to grow freer from sin and more like Christ. To the church of Philippi, he said, be, in, be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. In other words, just as he says, flee youthful thought of, of passions. He says, do not love the world as the world loves. You and I need to consider the way in which we entertain ourselves, the way in which we live, the way in which we think, the way in which we express ourselves. Is it different from the world? If not, then how does anyone know whether or not you are a Christian? Probably the most terrible words anyone can ever hear. And I've heard this myself when I worked in, you know, a corporate world or the business world. Spending time and hours with people, 40, 45 hours a week, week on, on week on, month on, year. And then someone says, finally, you talk about churches. And, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. I didn't know you go to church. Well, what awful words that might be. There ought to be something that says, I knew there was something different about you. That's what 1 Peter was all about. How is it that you have hope in this world? How are you you handling death so much differently than other people? How are you dealing with disappointment and frustrations? Why is it 
that you do not do these things. That's what he calls us to do. And Paul says, or Peter, excuse me, says that we must be at peace. There is a peace that, that should be among its people. That's true, we are to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. But the peace he's speaking about primarily is that which being peace with right with God. The Apostle Paul encourages the believers at Rome that Christ's sacrifice actually accomplishes something tangible and practical. He says, we have been justified by faith. Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this. You probably already know how I'm going to finish it. People will say, well, I have no problem with God. Me and God, we got us an agreement. But again, you're going to finish the statement for me, right? You may not have a problem with God, but what? God has a problem with you. The Bible says that we're rebellious. Romans 1 says that we're all guilty. People think, well, I'm okay with God. No, we're not. Ephesians tells us that we are dead and our trespasses of sin and that we need a, a savior, not a life coach, not a, not a moral teacher, but we need a, a savior, one to save us from the wrath of God. We've seen that in 1 Peter as well. The Apostle John wrote in his letter, but this is love perfected in it with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. Let me ask you, in that dark night of the soul, when you consider yourself, when you look into that mirror and you see the person that you are, when you're openly honest and you understand your failings and your failures, how do you see yourself? How do you feel others see yourself? I spoke about this last week. How do you feel that Jesus sees you? Now, when I consider that, that just breaks my heart because how I see myself is not how Jesus sees me at all praise God because the gospel tells us that God sees us so much differently but what we have to realize is if you were to stand before God right now this moment and he were to say to you why should I let you into my kingdom why should I let you in my heaven how would you answer would you have the confidence to say because I have accepted Christ based on your agreement that you and I have peace? Do you have that type of confidence? That comes not because we work good and we do good, but because what Christ has done for us. And I know that God is faithful even when I am not. That's the only thing, by the way, that gets me up in the morning. Because I already know as soon as I put two feet on the floor... I've blown it. It's the fact that God is at peace with me. And that's our ministry of reconciliation that we talked about earlier in our adult core class. As you and I are, are to spread that and share that with others. So Peter says, be at peace with God. Know that God is not your enemy. You are no longer objects of his wrath if you are his children. So I would just beg with you this morning, settle that issue. Are you at peace with God? Or are you still a child of disobedience, an object of his wrath? That's what his word says, not I. But that's how he describes all of us who are born, no matter what age, who we're born for, from, where we're from. But not only does that, not only are we to be diligent and be at peace, but he says the second thing I need you to be aware of. During this delay, you must count the patience of God as salvation. You must recognize that during this delay, do not be frustrated, do not be discouraged. Don't be impatient, don't be frustrated, don't be angry or despondent as you wait for God's delay. Now, some of you may say, well, I, I don't feel that way. And that's probably because you and I are too earthly minded. We are not eagerly desiring, eagerly anticipating, eagerly uh, expecting Christ's return. We spoke of this during this lesson, this series. And you and I must come face to face with that. Am I eagerly desiring the things of God or do I love the things of this world more? If we're honest, if I'm honest, I would have to say I do. 
And I would pray that you would join me in prayer that my heart would be transformed in the same way that I'm calling for you to be transformed. But he says, don't be angry, don't be patient. Sometimes I get that way. You know, here I am a a year after surgery. I got surgery on my heel uh, heel, May 21st or 24th of last year. So I'm just hitting that year. And I did it so I could run and play softball and play with Landon, the grandson, and do more. But here I am a year later, and I'm actually worse off than I was before the surgery. Don't ask me who my surgeon was. I will not give you. Well, I'll warn you. But I'm like, what is going on? I am so impatient. It is so difficult. It's like, should I have even done the surgery? And maybe there's a, a, a question there. But this delay of healing is taking longer than I anticipated. Age, factors, things of like that come into it. But we're not to be impatient or despondent. Now you may get that because you're experiencing some difficulties in your life. Some health things that are much more than just the inconvenience of me limping from time to time. Maybe yours is, is, a, is a real life cancer that you're fighting Maybe it's the death of, of loved ones that you just can't handle any longer. Maybe it's like you and like suffering from me. It's just the presence of sin and continually uh, fighting it. But he says, don't get to the point where you doubt God. The false teachers were using this delay to ridicule the believers into discounting the doctrine of Christ. They were using it to manipulate them to doubt the goodness and faithfulness of God. It can be easy to become distracted by the lures of this world, to become dismissive of the commands of Christ, and to be discouraged by the effects of the presence of sin. We see it in wars. We see it in racism and prejudices. We see it in the death of newborns and school shootings. And it's like, how much more can we take? Where are you, God? But we are not to bring that type of accusation against God. For we're to count the patience of God as salvation. We yearn for righteousness and justice, but we see no hope. Where is it? But you and I are hold on to the hope of the coming of the King of Righteousness, who will make all things righteous. Now when I say hope again, you know what I'm speaking here. We're not talking about wishful thinking. Oh, I hope he comes. I hope I win the lottery. No, hope in biblical words is a confident expectation. I know that my Redeemer liveth. The prophet yells and screams out in times of suffering. I know that God is faithful. You and I do need to remember that God is working during this delay in gathering his sheep, in calling them to repentance. Christ's delay actually has a purpose. As Jesus taught in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He says, I need to collect some more. I must bring them also in and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd. And I'm thankful for that delay for without that delay, I would not know Christ. My children would not know Christ. I pray that land and my grandson will come to know Christ. After 30 years of rejecting Christ and Since we began a church as a family, my dad came to know Christ. So I'm thankful for God's delay in that matter. The word count here, when he says don't count or count the patience of God, the word count here means to govern. It doesn't mean just sit here and and count numerically, but it means to govern. It's to lead your life from the principle. In other words, you and I need to recognize that the patience of God is meant to lead to salvation. So you and I must think and govern and make our decisions, not based on the here and now, but based on what God is going to do in the new heavens and the new earth. When he judges the wicked and rescues the godly. The time that you and I are allotted on here, here on earth is difficult and rewarding. It is full of suffering and full of joy. But that time, this delay, is meant for you and I to be the aroma and the fragrance of God. 
the ministers of reconciliation. You and I are to be calling people to repent of their dead, dead trespasses. You may say, what is then? The world is that. To be dead in your trespasses means to work your way to Christ. Oh, I'm going to church. I'm doing good. I'm giving to charity. I'm helping in the soup kitchens. I'm being a nice person. The Bible says those are as filthy rags. They're dead. Those still cause us to be short of the glory of God. So to repent of trying to do it ourselves and turn to Christ. This is what it means when we spend our time and money, money and energy doing. Are we counting? Are we governing our lives by this thought? Dustin pointed on this. We're to be on point. Our mission is to share the gospel. You're to govern your mind. You're govern your thinking by this very point and principle. In summary, this is what Peter is saying. Don't be lax. Don't be a sluggard. Don't be um, distracted during this delay, but use your time wisely. As scripture said earlier, and I read in our scripture reading, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of our time because the days are evil. So let me just stop right there. How are you using your time? How are you using this delay? Are you living for yourself? Fulfilling your own uh, desires and, and principles and purposes or those of Christ. One day we will give account. Yes, our souls will save, will be saved, but the Bible says that even the Christian will stand before God and have all that he done tried by fire. First Corinthians chapter three. Will it be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble? Or will it find itself refined as gold and silver and precious stones? What is the sum of your life? I yearn for the day in which, the, which when, when, when my children lay me to rest, that you can say to me what, what, what Pat, well, the Apostle Paul said of King David. He served God in his generation and then he slept. He served the purposes of God in his generation. Whose purposes do you serve? If we're honest, we'd have to say that's a daily battle. That's a moment-to-moment -moment battle. That's sanctification, stupid, if we want to take that old phrase out. That's the battle that you and I have, is we have a battle. Do I serve myself today, or do I serve the purposes of God? Peter's last words. He went to the cross for this. Tradition says that he was, he was crucified upside down. This was so important to him to pursue godliness and to live his life during the delay in giving Christ everything. Well, let's go to the next section. As we move to, verse, to the rest of verse 15 and 16, Peter maintains that his teachings and instructions complement Paul. And again, you always have people that will take one biblical teacher, one pastor, and, one, and what they use, they use them to combat each other. Just like a child will take his mother and father and use them to do battle so that he may win. Be careful of that, parents. In the same way, people will do that in the church. And that's what they're doing. Listen, Paul teaches this. Peter teaches this. Let's go with Paul. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter one will tell us what Paul thought of that. Am I of Apollos? If I am Paul, am I Peter? No, I'm of Jesus. And I'd bring you to read that later in this, this memorial weekend, if you would. He admits, concedes, that Paul's letters can be difficult, but he says, Paul and I are in agreement. We are teaching the same thing. We got the message from the same Holy Spirit. We're writing the words of the same God. We are in agreement. They may be difficult to understand, but in the same time, he proclaims they are, they are, they are considered Scripture. Scripture tells us that we should accept and treasure and approach Scripture, the Bible, as the very words of God. He says all scripture is breathed by God. It's here on the monitor here, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
He says all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Instead of treasuring God's word, the false teachers have twisted them for their own ends. He calls them ignorant, leading us to Paul's, or Paul's letter to 2 Corinthians, in which he states, The God of this world, speaking of uh, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Why? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Paul's letters were well known. They were circulated around, this, around the different churches as he encouraged them to do. And he wanted them to understand what God had to say. Now what they were doing is they were using Paul's letters to say, see, we are free from the law. And so because we are free from the law, you and I could live any way that we want. And there are some passages of scripture where Paul seems to say something similar. He says, for by the works of the law... No human will be made justified or right with God. He goes on to say that we are justified by faith apart from works. He goes on to say that the law came so that the, to increase the trespass. But what you and I need to understand that the, Paul was not teaching that you and I are free from the law. For the law served the purposes of God in its time. It was a schoolmaster, so to speak. It was to teach us what God expected of his people. It's what you and I do to show that you and I are sinners and that we need a savior. It directs us to God and to the gospel. The law still has a purpose today. Without the law, you and I would not know that we're sinners or that we do not have or that we have a need of a savior. So I will say you cannot unhitch the law from the gospel and from scripture. They interpreted these statements to be justification for abandoning the law. But we see that they're false teachers, these false teachers, their error is more than misinterpretation, but a purposeful twisting of the scriptures. Their goal was to entice people to join them in their debauchery, in their wicked behavior. Their desire was to use others to, to, to gain pleasure. Peter says you must be careful for there are people in the church that will do the same thing. And Peter does not want his readers to fall in the same trap. So in verse 17, he writes, knowing this beforehand. In other words, since you know their method of operation, I want you to do two things. One of them is kind of a negative, one of them is a positive. And with this, we're going to bring it to a close. He says, here's two things you must do. Knowing that false teachers will come in your church. First one, the negative is take care not to be fooled or influenced by them, or risk losing your own stability. You and I need to be taking care that you and I are not fooled by false teachers. We need to be vigilant. We need to be firm in our faith. We cannot be double-minded, but secure and confident in the teachings of Christ and our faith. He also tells us that we must not lose our stability. What he's talking about there is apostasy. That's falling away from Christ. That's once believing the words of Christ, maybe coming to them favorably, but then starting to see the word of God as not relevant to you and to live your life as if Christ is not the Lord. And he says, be careful that this does not happen to you. The apostle Paul and John warned people of that. He says, I hear there's divisions among you. He goes on to say there must be factions in the church because factions themselves show who are generally Christians and who are not. John would say they went out from us. They were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued. But those who fall away prove that they are not true Christians at all. That's why scripture tells us to be careful, to watch, to, to examine our lives, to test our faith. To see whether or not we're in the faith. So the negative is to, be, is to make sure that you're not being fooled. And to lose your stability. The positive then is instead of being fooled. The positive is says instead grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior 
Jesus Christ. Now grow means to increase. You and I must first understand that sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit who moves within us to make us more like Christ. Secondly, it involves our conscious and willing submission to the work and word of God. In other words, that's why you see in Scripture to put away, to put on, to yield. There is a work of God in which the Holy Spirit comes and takes His word and calls us to respond to what God is calling. At the end of this message, you'll hear that prayer. Father, work in us. Help us to see what you called us to do. Then you and I are to move willingly in submission to yield to that work. In that battle against sin, I want to encourage you, do not be frustrated. Do not be distracted. Do not be disappointed, but trust in God who is greater than he that is in the world. Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones writes this, The process of growth is of necessity, a process which is progressive and gradual. If you're here this morning and you're struggling in your faith, if there are times where you doubt whether or not you're saved or not, I want to encourage you, many go through that. In your battle of sin, if you feel like you're just underwater and Satan is just taking, pounding you, uh, then you need to realize that that is part of life. But God says that he is faithful and that he will help us to be overcome. I'd like to take a moment if I could. And I want to take you through one of the the great hymns that we sing here. We sung it last week. It's called, I I Ask the Lord That I May Grow. And and the reason I want to share this, and I've been wanting to do it for some time, and this gave me a great opportunity, is that this song just put me down right on my seat. About the second or third time that I sung it, and I actually thought of the words. And I'd like for you just to to, to read silently with me as I share and take you through what this goes through. First off, this song is just a prayer from John Newton. He was a slaveholder. He was a a boat owner. You know him as the as the writer of Amazing Grace. And his heart and his mind was just pun intended, enslaved by his past. He could he could hear the screams of the slaves who who were entrapped in his boat. Many who died on the journey from Africa back to England and to other ports. You can imagine how he did not feel worthy to be a servant and a pastor of God. So here's his prayer that he put into song. He says this, and this is you and I can understand this. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and in love and in every grace. You and I desire that, do you not? I think we do. That I might more of his salvation know and that I might earnestly seek his face that's what Peter is asking us to do and I pray that's your prayer it may be not as as eloquent and as in poetry as his is but you and I pray for that it says it was Jesus who taught me thus to pray and he I trust has answered prayer in other words I trust that Jesus will answer prayer but in such a way he almost drove me to despair and this is here where it starts to get kind of uncomfortable He goes on to say, I hope that in some favorite hour at once that he would answer my prayer, that God would answer my prayer. This was my hope. Isn't that your hope, that God would answer prayer? And by his love constraining power, would he subdue my sins and give me rest? By the way, that's my prayer every morning. Father, restrain me from my sin. I pray the Lord's prayer. Lord, do not deliver me from the evil one. Do not lead me into temptation. That should be our prayer. And what John is looking here, John Newton, he's looking for is an answer to prayer that would come down and just take away his sin and his desires. And the battle would be over. I pray that. If any of you know anyone that's had an addiction to drugs, to alcohol, maybe yourself as well, we're all addicted to some type of sin. And very often you hear their stories. My brother has a large addiction ministry. And many often you hear these people come in and they'll tell you stories. Oh, I got saved and I put away cigarettes and never had desired another one. I never desired another lick of liquor. I never desired this. But you know, those are so far and few between. But more or less you hear is those who just for days, months, and years struggle with the same addiction. And they begin to despair. God, where are you? 
Do you not hear my cry? I am so tired of fighting this battle. John says, would you subdue my sin and give me rest? So tired of fighting this battle every moment. This is what set me down on my seat, this next line. Instead of this, instead of subduing my sins and giving me rest, this is what God did. He made me feel the hidden evils of my heart, hidden in the fact that you do not know them, but I know them, you know them in your own heart. And he let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. My sin was so strong and the battle so difficult that to my very bone and marrow and soul, I despaired. God allowed that to happen. Could you hear the cry and despair in his voice and in these words? Yea, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. Now he's looking at God and he, like David, is saying, what are you doing to me? I'm made of flesh. I will just turn to dust. Turn your eyes from me, as Job would say. Remove your hand. I cannot handle this evil any longer, this sin, this temptation. Across all the fair designs, I schemed, I humbled my heart, and God laid me low. Not one more blow, Lord, not one more. Please stop. Lord, why is this? He cried. I tremble, he cried, he writes. Will thou presume thy worm to death? I hear Job's voice in this. I hear David. I hear the Apostle Paul who said, I cried to the Lord three times, will you deliver me from this thorn in the flesh? And what did God say? No. No. But my grace is sufficient. Tis this way he echoes Paul's word. The Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. In other words, you and I are praying for the wrong thing. We're praying for deliverance from sin. That won't happen until Christ comes. So we should pray for that. But he says, you, the prayer that I answer is that you will have more grace. Pray that I would give you a stronger measure of grace and a stronger measure of faith to fight that sin. What does Paul say? Though my foe slay me, you have not shed blood or sh you have not fought sin to the point of shedding blood. I will have you tell you at times, I feel like Loki after Hulk got a hold of him. I'm just a puny human. And that was just a marvel. DC better than Marvel, just, just point. But listen to what Jesus answers. This is God's answer to him. God says, I answer prayer for grace and faith. Pray for grace and faith. Why? Because these inward trials that I, God, employ from self and pride is what I want you to set free. I'm not trying to take away your sin. I'm trying to take away your pride and set you free from yourself. Why? So that I can break thy schemes of earthly joy. How you seek to find satisfaction in life. That you may find your all in me. What do you find your all in today? The things of Christ or the things of your own? John Newton says they're your own schemes. I'm not going to finish, but we're almost there. That could have been a message of its own. Grow in grace and in knowledge. The way you and I do that is we look at God differently. We come to know who Christ is is he says Christ is our Lord and our Savior. He's the Messiah. You and I can have peace and grace 
Peter promises us through scripture. He says that you and I can have fruitfulness in our Christian life, that we can have secret to freedom from defilement is trusting in Christ, that you and I need to grow in Christian love. Brothers and sisters, let me end by this. As you and I wait for the day of Christ, let us with one accord submit to the Lordship of Christ by pursuing holiness and godliness that others may see and be led to Christ. Let others see Christ in you. May God strengthen and encourage us on this long and difficult journey. May we understand that you and I are called to live life together in this community, that God may be glorified. He ends with a doxology, to to the Lord may there be glory forever. May we be diligently waiting patiently, but also eagerly as we take care of ourselves, growing in grace and knowledge. Let me end with a letter or with a word from Jude. I believe it should be here on the monitor. He writes, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Until that day, may our song be, To God be the glory for great things he hath done. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Worship team, if you'd make your way up. I'm going to give you a moment just to consider what God's word has said. In what way do you need to be more diligent? In what way do you need to be more at peace? In what way do you need to govern your life according to what God has called us to live? In what way do you need to take care that you need not be distracted during this time, this time of delay? And in what ways do you need to grow in grace? Landon will be up here after the service. Well, I'm going to be up here at the end of the service just to kind of a prayer. I ask Dustin to do that. Dustin, you can come up. If you have a question, a prayer, I know we're going to be going to the picnic, but we want to take an opportunity. Maybe even during that time, we can set and discuss. Send me an email. Give me a call. I just want to encourage you. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you and I, may be ready for when God comes to rescue us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love for us. Father, I pray that we would respond to the Spirit's work. Whatever this may be, I I gave one message, but Lord, there there are many here. I pray that you would work in their heart to whatever way that they need, that they may yield to you, submit to your work, that you may be glorified. Make us ready until that day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.